Hello, everyone. Um, in the name of the Cuba Studies Program of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, uh, welcome to you all. Welcome again. <laughs> welcome the Vuelta. This is round two uh, of this event. And a very special welcome to our uh, guest, artist, educator, activist, and intellectual Tanya Bruguera. Uh, just a note on logistics. Um, we had to move, uh, we wanted initially to do this on a, a Zoom platform. We had to move to a webinar uh, format because we had close to 700 people registered for the event. And of course, that would, uh, that would just be too many people for, for a Zoom session. Um, I'm Alejandro La Fuente and I'm here in my capacity as chair of the Cuba Studies Program. And I will be joined today in the moderation of this event uh, by my dear colleague uh, and friend and uh, uh, an accomplice, Professor Doris uh, Sommer, Ira and Jewel Williams, Professor of Romance Languages and Literatures, and Professor of African and African American Studies uh, uh, at Harvard. She's also, also the director of the Cultural Agents Initiative at Harvard University. Doris is a member of the faculty committee of the Cuba Studies Program and a champion of the humanities, someone who has tirelessly advocated uh, for the centrality of the arts in the construction of inclusive and democratic societies. I'm also joined by Karina Skunse, who is a junior uh, concentrating in neuroscience with a secondary in global health and health policy at Harvard. Karina, along with Franklin Sivantos, is the co-president of Harvard CAUSA, the Cuban American Undergraduate Student Association, uh, an organization that a couple of years ago, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the, of the association at Harvard. Uh, CAUSA works with the Cuba Studies Program to develop Cuba-related uh, programming at the university, and we organize events like this and many others. We are, I always say, after all, first and foremost about our students. I want to express our gratitude to the Embassy of the Czech Republic in Havana uh, for their support for this event, and especially to the Honorable Ambassador, Mr. Pietro Kavan, and to Consul Petra Novachkova. We are grateful for helping us with the logistics for this event. And now let me welcome Tania back uh, and, and let me thank her. Let me say gracias to her for being with us uh, today. Tania Bruguera is one of Cuba's internationally best known uh, artists. Someone who has stretched the definition and range of performance art, sometimes performing solo, but more often staging participatory events that build on concerns about repression, censorship, and control, not just in Cuba, by the way, but in many other uh, sites uh, globally. This is perhaps illustrated best in her Immigrant Movement International Project, um, a project that she um, developed in collaboration with the Queens Museum of Art starting in 2011. This is a long-term art project uh, in the form of an artist initiated social political movement. At some point it was even like a political party that they were going to, uh, to create that, sought, that seeks to highlight the conditions that immigrant communities uh, face, including uh, frequently lack of proper representation uh, in many countries, including the United, uh, the United States. It's also an excellent example of how art operates in and can change uh, society, what it, what it means to create arte util, useful art. Art as intervention, art as collaborative and creative spaces for the solution of pressing social political problems, most centrally about how art can empower ordinary people and in the process create more participatory democratic societies. Tania is a graduate of the uh, Cuban Instituto Superior de Arte and also received an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2001. If I listed all her major exhibitions, we would actually run out of time. If I listed all the biennials which she has been invited and where she has participated, 
we would run out of time. So I'm not going to do that. I am simply, um, we can, uh, you can just check her CV online, which is very easy to see. Let me, let me add, however, that her works are in major museum collections around the world from the Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes to MoMA in New York City. Let me also say, to go back to her work, that Tanya spent a year with us at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute uh, as a Radcliffe Fellow in 2016, 2017. I remember that as a great year, because it was a year in which we had an opportunity to talk frequently and to exchange ideas uh, with her. And in a sense, this presentation is a continuation of those conversations. This is not something that started today. And Doris was very much part of all those conversations and of many dinners and, uh, and good moments. During her fellowship here, Tanya continued to work on what is perhaps one of her most important recent projects, the Havana-based Instituto de Artivismo Hannah Arendt in Star. Now, my first question was going to be about INSTAR. That was going to start when in our previous, in our previous, and the previous iteration of this event, I was going to lead with a question about INSTAR. Today, however, I feel that before I ask about INSTAR, I need to ask a different question. And that question is, que paso? What happened? Uh, I, what happened last time? What made it impossible for you, Tanya? to uh, join us as when we originally scheduled this conversation and your presentation. Well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, making a second take on this conversation and for your patience and the patience of the people who are joining us to, because they're coming back to be with us. Um, thank you so much to the embassy, the Czech Republic embassy. Uh, it almost feels that today to talk freely, you have to uh, talk through, go through international channels <laughs> in Cuba. Uh, so basically what happened is that um, today, the Cuban government is extremely afraid of people spreading the world on their experience right now. So many, many years ago, the government had complete control over the propaganda and the narrative of the country and of what was happening here. On one side, there was, uh, there was very little uh, news internationally and the ones that were coming out of Cuba were very much controlled by the government. Today, this is not happening this way. Each of us, when we talk, we are telling our story and in each of these story is the seed to challenge the official, um, the official discourse. So I think what happened last time is the government illustrated the title of the talk, which was about censorship and they enacted the censorship and they cut uh, all my internet and telephone um, services. Today, I also have internet and telephone services cut, uh, by the way. So this is a new practice that is happening in Cuba where the government is um, uh, making sure that uh, technology is used on their favor because they, they are of course the one who owns everything. So now it's very frequent that the, the only telephone company that we have here, which is a, a government one, cut individual um, access to internet to activists. So this is what happened last time, but we insisted and here we are. Yeah, well, thank Thanks you, you know, thank you for that. I mean, it, it, it really sounds so, so not only so counterproductive, but in some ways so counterintuitive to enact a moment of censorship when we are going to have a conversation about, uh, about uh, censorship, um, you know, and by the way, the, Censorship has been something central to your work uh, since forever. This is not something that you started working on. So let me go back to, let me go you back. Know, I, want to, I want to tell you Alejandro that censorship here has changed over time. Before the government uh, realized, let's say that an exhibition had a painting or an sculpture or whatever that is creating some, you know, some opinions that are not good for them and they closed 
those exhibitions. Then they say, this is not good because it's a scandal. So they went to see the exhibitions before they were opening to make sure they select the work before everybody sees it. Didn't work as well because people talk and everybody knew they were censorship. So then they went to the artist's studios to talk to artists and see what are they doing and see if they can change their, their, their production. But also that is being talked about. So we are all sharing this experience. And now I think we're living in the minority report Cuban government era where they are trying to stop you before you even have the idea. So they are stopping themselves. So they're really censoring themselves because they're the one thinking what we're going to say about this government. So they're the real dissidents actually. So this is what we have now. They don't want us to do, uh, you know, one day I had a meeting in my house and we were just a group of people and they, they came to tell us they would not let us go out and march in protest. And we are like, thank you very much for the idea. We didn't have any idea. Thank you for you, the government giving us the idea. So this is, this is what happens now. We're living in the minority report, the Cuban government era. Yeah. Well, They're afraid, more than afraid of us. Let me go back to INSTAR because uh, again, I was going to lead with a question about INSTAR in, in the previous version. I still want to hear about INSTAR because I think it's, um, uh, by the way, yesterday, uh, the, the Instituto, the Instituto Artivismo, Hannah Arendt, uh, turned six years old. Uh, May 20th is the day in which we celebrate, um, the, commemorate um, um, the establishment, the creation of the Cuban Republic. And INSTAR was created uh, on May 20th, 2015, I believe. Um, you have noted, um, Tanya, in some of your interviews that at some point in your career, you transitioned from talking about problems to trying to solve those problems, to intervene in those problems, from representation to proposals that could possibly make a difference. Um, and INSTAR seems to be a very good example of this because um, it's conceived as a hub for what you call civic literacy in Cuba, un centro de alfabetización cívica in Cuba. And I think it's fair to say that uh, INSTAR is perhaps, or has become, if not your most visible proposal, one of the most visible and important proposals in the last uh, few years. It's certainly, in my way, in my view, an excellent way to start this conversation, right? So why don't you tell us about the Institute, about how it was created, how it has evolved, and some of the challenges it faces now? Well, uh, yes, we are this week celebrating the one anniversary of the project. Of course, every year is harder and harder to do the project. Uh, so we are celebrating uh, very much every year. Um, Instar was actually inspired by a member of the secret police, my interrogator. Because in one of the interrogator sessions, um, I did a project in 2014, December 2014, when I invited P Cubans uh, during the, when they announced, Obama and Raul uh, announced they're going to establish the relationship or start that process. I actually called people to go to a revolution square, put a microphone and say what were their vision of the future for Cuba and the idea of a nation that they wanted. So of course that uh, many people went, but the thing did not happen. Many people were in prison, etc. So I started my endless uh, interrogation experience in Cuba. And in one of the interrogation session, the interrogator called Kenya uh, told me, yes, but uh, the name of your project is Tatling Whisper. And Vladimir Tatling was a revolutionary. And I said, yes, me too. No, we are the revolutionaries. I said, no, 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 no. You call yourself revolutionary. We are the revolutionaries. But Okay, and then she moved on and she say, but why you use that name? And then I started to talk to her and, and did some sort of like art history class with her and realized in the process that what we need in Cuba in order to achieve any freedom or any democratic space is civic education. Because I realized that, that the only way we cannot, we are not going to end up 
with violence in the transition that is inevitable in this country is if we have a proper civic education and we give people the tools to speak to each other, to recognize each other's differences without uh, hurting each other and to not forget, but forgive. You know, so I think this is also some of the of the things we wanted. And we, from the beginning, we had this phrase where we say that in Cuba, there was a literacy campaign, literacy campaign where people learn how to read. But what do you do if you know how to read, but they don't let you read what you want and they don't let you write what you think. So this is the other side of the literacy campaign that we are doing. Um, the, the other thing is we have from the beginning started a project that is every day more defined, of course, it's a living, it starts a living organism that reacts, uh, transpire, uh, you know, that get in symbiotic with other processes uh, that give birth to other things. Um, but more than anything, we are lately very focused on how to understand um, the history of the descent in Cuba. Because one of the tools the government has used is that uh, the dissidents or the artists who, who descend or people who have been trying to create alternative projects or autonomous projects, social and civic projects are just few crazy people. They are not interconnected. So one of the things we're doing in Instar is recuperating a history that is more than 40 and 50 years old of projects, civic projects, artistic projects, censorship that has been happening uh, in order to create some sort of uh, alternative narrative to who we are and, and, and in a way know better how to define ourselves, not only for what we do, but in relationship with the others who did it before. Yeah, I don't know if that is. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah. I'm going to very quickly. Uh, <laughs> there are many elements. So this is very quickly. Give the yeah. floor to to my colleague Doris Summer. Thank you. Thank you so much for including me in this conversation. Um, I uh, I really appreciate um, working with Alejandro. Looking forward to working even more with you, Tanya. Uh, I feel we've just started. And I'd like you to develop the, uh, the idea that you've been presenting about art as a civic education. Uh, I think this is where uh, INSTAR and uh, cultural agents um, connect because uh, as you know, some artists are um, so focused on the personal freedom that art allows that they're reticent to consider the um, collective uh, responsibilities or effects of intervention. So uh, I think that the public might be interested in your reflections, I know that they would, on the tension between uh, freedom and responsibility in art making. And then what does that have to do with civic education? Because one of the real um, powerful uh, aspects of your work uh, for me and for many people, is the way you reflect on the process and on the effects of the process. And that reflection is what um, I consider to be the area of the humanities as a link, perhaps, to interventions through art and civic effects. Um, and you, you bring those levels together through making and thinking and inviting us all to think and make together. So that's that's an area I just invite you to develop now with us. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I'm glad to see you again. Um, so yes, I think the um, I think we have been uh, educated in general into a culture of production. You know, we are we have been leading. Um, or, or told or, or educated to produce. And in the process, we have forgotten that maybe art should not be anymore a, product, a process of producing something, but maybe the process of inserting yourself into something. 
and incorporating all that knowledge that you bring uh, through art into certain social and political processes. So it's not anymore about having a result, about having a product that you can sell, you can be proud of, you can you know, give to other people. It's more about how you create, a, a, let's say an ecosystem that works positively and that understand all the complexity of the, of the process without damaging people in the process. So I think this is something that um, I've been really interested in. And I always talk about ecosystem as art, as an eco social art, as an ecosystem. Because I always say that I want when people are coming to the projects I'm doing to understand the distance that exists between what they experience in their everyday life and in the project, understanding at the same time that this is part of their life and it could be part of their everyday life. So the distancing is very important, but, um, but I think uh, it's, uh, it's a process of also uh, understanding, at least in Cuba, for example, uh, you have to understand what are the things that are missing and what are the things that you have and having a, making a balance between those two. For example, I think part of what happened in Cuba, and this is what we're doing in Instar as well, is that we have not yet understood how to be part of the world. You know, here the government all the time says, Cuba has to be part of the world. And yeah, but they want to do it in their own terms you know, without understanding the world. So that won't work. Uh, so part of what we want to do is understanding how, uh, how do you uh, keep your, identity, your local identity, your own group identity, while you are connecting to other identities and to other ways of seeing the world, you know, basically. And that's something that we're trying to do in, in, in INSTAR by bringing some activists from other people. We brought people from Black Lives Matter. We, we brought a, a group of uh, advisors uh, from Argentina. And we bring all these people uh, to Cuba and in the contrast, creating the contrast between what we don't know yet and what doesn't work in the world anymore, finding this um, space in between, you know. So I think this in a way is, is part of what we're doing uh, as well. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, the beginning of many, I hope, many conversations to develop this work. Yes. It's. Um, so so important to make that distinction between producing things for a market and um, changing expectations by inserting oneself. Yeah. Yeah, it's very different because when you have when you know that you're going to end up with a product, all your energies go towards that, and no matter what happened in the process, no matter who gets hurt, who what you will, uh, don't notice, you know because it's about having a result, no? But in this case, and you know this better than me because you work in the same uh, social projects, no? Where the process is um, sometimes even more important than, than having- Yeah, if, if I, I can just add, add to that. Sometimes when I ask people, what is democracy? Is it, is it um, a product or a process? And when people say it's a product, I know we're in trouble. Run, run, <laughs> run! Because uh, yes, if we if we can learn from you to understand that process is making art and make a connection between democratic life and knowing how to make art together, I think we'll make a yeah. step forward. Yeah. And also, part of what we're doing in Instar as well is is understanding and providing the knowledge that there are more than one kind of activism. Activism is not only going out on the street with, with uh, some uh, you know, uh, words or chanting. There is also legal activism. There is also academic activism. There is also you know, uh, artistic activism. So I think we are trying as well to give as many um, a broad sense of what activism is. So people understand that wherever they are, whatever their job is, they can be an active citizen. 
and they can fight for freedom of expression and they can fight for democracy. They don't have to be always in the street. I always remember when I was in Occupy Wall Street that I talked with a friend of mine who didn't go to any of the rallies or, or anything like that. And he, he felt really a shame and you know because oh i'm not going to and we were saying no you need to be in your house writing the text that support our bodies in the street so everyone have to understand that everyone uh, there are many kinds of activism you no know, for example right now i did a i put a legal case for defamation against a um, a national tv uh, newscast uh, person and and some people say but why you do that that you know already the laws are not uh, in Cuba are not for the people are for defending the government why do you and I say because there is also a legal activism that I'm interested at I'm interested in showing how unjust the laws are in Cuba and how much they are not working and how much part of the reason why people are afraid and why people are, are thinking twice before going to the street is because they know the laws do not support them at all. So I think this is, this is uh, an interesting moment also in Cuba to, to put that test, all of these things that you and I have been talking for years, actually, um, and see if they work or not. Thank you, Tanya. Karina, would you like to follow up? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, primarily wanted to thank you again for being here with us, Tanya. Um, Kausa is immensely grateful to be able to hear from you. Um, and I think as students, it's like empowering hearing from activists who are doing the underground work with their art, like you're doing with Instar. And especially in light of everything happening with Movimiento San Isidro and Patria Vida and other broad forms of activism, as you were saying. Um, and so my question is then, um, how do we like as students, as young people, um, as Cuban American students and as students at Harvard, um, how can we best support artists and movements and civic education to that end um, in Cuba? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having your organization for so long. I know Cubans are persistent, so you're showing that. And thank you so much for coming back uh, to this one. No, I think there are many ways to support, uh, but one way that is needed today is that people believe the people who are talking here from their own experience. We are fighting 60 years of propaganda that is extremely successful. If one thing has worked in this country, economy didn't work, social justice didn't work, nothing worked. What well, the only thing that worked was propaganda. They have the best, one of the best propaganda machines in the world. And, the, and diplomatic also. Uh, so that's what we have to, to, we can help people with. If you have the story of a person that is talking about what happened to them, please believe them. Stop believing what the government is saying. The government is creating a narrative that is not real, that is all, only to support um, the network they have created over the year of solidarity with groups that should be solid in solidarity with us, actually. And this is something that is also interesting. Many of you young students are probably part of many movements, you know, what Black Lives Matter, Latino movements, uh, you know, I don't know, many, many movements fighting for different injustices. Please remember that in Cuba, we have the same rights that you have in the United States and in the world to fight for our rights. So when you see that a, an activist is being taken into prison, an activist is being taken, like today, Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara is in a hospital, sequestered in a hospital without us knowing anything about them and the news are only the government mm, leaks that they want to give. Please, when we are fighting for our right, give us the benefit of the doubt. Be in solidarity with us and not with the government. Try to understand where we're coming from, try to understand our experience and try to be with us. For us, it's not possible to conceive, so we can conceive the fact that there are group from the left and there are group uh, that defend social, that are against social injustices, fighting for the same things that we are fighting for, and they're against us because they're defending the Cuban government. That is something I cannot understand. 
not generationally, not politically, nothing. You know, so this is what we need to, to understand that we are people with very few resources against a government with all the resources. Because in Cuba, there is no food. In Cuba, you have to do eight hours of line to buy whatever bad things to eat that day. But what we have is an amazing float of cars for the police, an amazing army, and an amazing everything for repression that we have in excess. So please understand that we are activists with very few resources, learning in the process, and also trying to change peacefully this country. And actually in the process, we have endured a lot of humiliation from the government, a lot of defamation from the government, and a lot of processes to, uh, in order to crumble our internal um, solidarity and, and, and you know, between different activists. So please try to be with us and not with the government. Now, there is something I, I love about your, about your answer, <laughs> about your answer to Karina, which is uh, stay engaged, uh, stay on top of things, uh, keep learning, uh, keep informing yourselves. We've been talking process. Well, it is a process, right? Learning is a process. It's a never ending process. And as we do that, it's important to, it's important uh, to, and I'm talking to our students here now, it's important to uh, it's important to look for information. And, and that's a privilege we have. And it's a privilege that needs to be used. Uh, you can go out there and you can actually excavate the information. And, and sometimes, Alejandro, sometimes also there are uh, problems of language in order uh, how activists in Cuba express themselves. We have to understand that here many people don't have the tool, they don't have the long term education, and they are actually, whenever they speak up, they are doing a double or triple effort that anybody in the world will do because they're going against a big machine. And actually, the fact that sometimes people don't know how to express what they feel doesn't mean that they're not feeling it, doesn't mean that that reality does not exist, you know, and this is also part of the complexity, no? when people are looking at, at Cuban activists and, you know. But it is a For example, in Cuba, there is a big, no, in Cuba, there is a big, a, a big, big uh, governmental uh, gentrification project, a huge. People don't have here, many people don't have here the language or the tools to understand, analyze and criticize or, or, or deconstruct the gentrification process that the government is doing where they leave buildings to crumble in order for this uh, or for the families to go. And then they turn that and they build uh, a hotel. This is gentrification, but because some people here haven't seen that before, they don't know how to talk about it. It doesn't mean that this is not happening. So sometimes when people come from outside, please be open and generous with us and share with us the experiences that are similar even if we don't see it so much or or if you don't want to see it so much because sometimes it's the people who come who don't want to see what's happening here you know they want to go to the parties but not to the to the slum the slummers you know you know one and of the one of the things i have learned over the years working with uh with activists from the afro descendant movement from all of latin america is that one of the things that activism does best is to pose questions is to provoke questions and then it is upon us in academia to explore those questions, to search for answers, to help, to contribute, to participate in the process of knowledge production. And, and in that process, there is something about your work, which I have always loved uh, and I continue to love. And it's, it is this emphasis on, you were talking about propaganda, you were talking about ways in which the past has been constituted and it's been remembered. And your work has always been very historical, has always been kind of, um, you have always been involved in some kind of historiographic project of recovering pasts, or of challenging narratives, of producing new pasts, pasts that were not useful or that had been obliterated or that had not been recognized. And I would, I would love to hear uh, from you about this, about the, the centrality of history and memory in, in your work. 
And I want to connect that with a couple of uh, with a couple of questions that have come from the from the audience. One of them from a dear colleague in in Madrid, uh, Lole Gonzalez Ripoll, who asks if you draw inspiration from previous examples of censors, previous uh, historical processes of censorship. She is thinking mostly about uh, Spain under Franco, whether we can learn from those experiences to. Uh, and then there is a related question by Elena Adele, uh, which, also, um, which also deals with questions of history and memory. And that this question is more about, basically about something you were referencing in your answer to Karina, which is, which is this fascination with the concept of the Cuban revolution that somehow precludes a critical engagement with, uh, with uh, you know, activism or with interventions like those you, like those you make, even from, from people who would be considered people on the left or who would be considered people who would be you know, staunch supporters of popular participation and and equality and social equality. Um, so, you know, I've, I've bundled several things into one big question, but it's all really around the same issue of memory and history and, and this historiographic project that is so central to your work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm being, I mean, I like very much history uh, and it has been an inspiration a lot, uh, historical moments. Um, and part of that is because, uh, I don't know, I'm, I have understood from very early on that um, there are histories that are being heated and the only way we can define where we are as Cuban is to hear all of the histories, not only part of them. So actually INSTAR has created um, the prize uh, Maria, Manuel Moreno Fraginals, who was your, your professor, your mentor. Um, for uh, the creation of a history book that will talk about those uh, narrative, those, those histories that were not being told, that had not been told, or those historical events that had not been analyzed or, or seen properly. So this, this you know, is part of that. Um, I think regarding to Franco and, and so on, I, I said uh, a while ago that it almost feels like the governments have a little yellow book they pass to each other on how to repress because many of them look very much alike and many of them I think borrow uh, strategies from each other because for example what they're doing to us on the internet is happening already in China. Um, the repression, uh, putting somebody in a hospital has been already done in Russia. Uh, so they are, I, I think they talk to each other probably on WhatsApp or something, the governments and, and oh, look what I did to this dissident, you should do that to yours. I don't know. So basically, I think we need to learn from that. Um, I've been part also of a, of a group of artists um, who are coming out of, of Spain, who is actually a, a group of anti-fascist group. Um, that have been related to, to processes of Franco, you know, like uh, uh, censorship done because of Franco. So yes, definitely, I think we need to learn from each other and we need to, uh, to understand that governments are an entity that repeats itself. So this is why it's so important to look at history because they have quite limited uh, level of creativities and uh, we need to learn how they done it before so we can be ahead of them. And this is what we do here, like uh, trying to see what happened before, we, we are a step ahead. Because I always say that you can only be an, a, 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 you know, an efficient, let's say, or efficace activist if you know this, the next step of the person who is going to repress you so you can be ahead of them. You know? Know, and the space you have between they figure it out what you're doing and how they can repress that is the only time you have to be uh, successful you know as an activist so I think this is um, this is something definitely that I'm really interested in. and um, um, the other thing is that we have been a uh, 
yeah so, so this is more or less what i wanted to say about that yeah yeah yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Doris uh, jump in. Let me just say that I think it's quite appropriate to have named that prize uh, after Manuel Moreno Fraginals, who was an irreverent iconoclast historian, a species of the dandy criollo picaflor who was always trying to bite from different sources and and who had a very uh, irreverent view of the Cuban past and its most sacred figures, uh, most of whom were in fact slave owners. So he was, I think it's very appropriate that Instar has um, claims that historiographic legacy has its own Doris. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I want to follow on that. I mean, the conversation is an inspiration for me to uh, try out connection. Uh, and the word irreverence, when you talk about a historian, is the bridge that uh, I invite Tanya to make with art. Because when she says that it's, it's the time between um, what you know the go government will do and what they respond to you that you have to make an intervention. Um, I think that I understand that moment as effective, to use your word again, uh, because an artist can be irreverent, make something surprising, make something that the government did not expect, uh, go beyond that yellow book. So um, I, I'd, I'd like you to maybe reflect or consider or maybe uh, think about it for a next conversation. What is it about art? that allows you to take advantage of that pause uh, between repression and repression and that spiral that Foucault describes. What is it about the irreverence of uh, a major historian that allows for a next step? Yeah. No, I think when you do art, it's not that you don't respect uh, reality, but you are not, this is us, it's us. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. So when you do art, it's not that uh, you don't respect what is happening in reality. It's more that you create a moment of uh, suspension of, of disbelief where you are pretending that things can happen in a different way. So I think this is the force that art can give to activism. Also, I think uh, the fact that Activism normally works uh, using elements that have worked before, things that they know uh, were efficient or they know they were, um, you know, they, they succeed. But artists are always trying things they don't know if it's going to work or not. They don't know what the outcome will be. We imagine this will be the response or not. And also art gives you the possibility of imagining yourself in different brains. Put yourself in the position of others and visualize them from the vision of different people, how to see what the same object or the same you know, feeling. The other thing that art does that is really good is, is a very, um, it's a good equipment to deal with emotions. And we all know that politics, good politicians are people who know how to deal properly with emotions and how to work, uh, move people through emotions. So art has, is one of the best ways to, I think, uh, confront that because we are experts on and especially on dealing with em the emotional world and with things that are not solved things that we don't know what they are so i think this is uh this is one of the things among many that at least work uh, but for example in cuba it has been very interesting because uh, it's not always the same uh yes it has been 60 years with the same people in power but it's not always the same way they have uh dealt with uh, dissent. And this is something that is important to know because if you see, and, and art uh, gives you the possibility of see things from, from in, a, in a very singular, from a big thing, go to the very detail, no? And, and in this case, we can see, for example, that the Cuban government has uh, looked at dissidents 
uh, and deal with the dissidents in different ways. They have um, suppressed people will hear, first of all, using enthusiasm. When first the, re when the revolution first uh, you know, came to, to power, they used enthusiasm as a way to control people because you had you you were happy because they happened but then they started to control enthusiasm and ask people to have a specific reaction to different political uh, things then they move into the idea of uh, cap uh, having people captive no to have people not knowing how what is the right and what is the wrong and trying to understand what is the right answer to not get into trouble you know then you have uh, another moment where it became more bureaucratic so they started that they already everybody was already afraid so they they started having these bureaucratic things where they understood the law as the way to have maximum control of everything. And I think uh, recently we have been looking at, and they, the, 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 the president of the country said it, that we are in a symbolic war or the war uh, to, to cash, you know, the perception. And I will say that now that has changed into a psychological war. I think we are now at a moment where the government is having a psychological war with their People. And I think that's extremely um, abusive. You know, I always say the Cuban government is like an abusive relationship, you know, domestic relationship. So I think now we are in this where you can see people, uh, you know, not seeing anything beyond this moment because the psychological war is also about uh, hope, it's about the possibility of seeing yourself 10 minutes from now, you know, and to imagine yourself and to imagine who you want to be, not even who you could be, but just who you want to be. So I think this is where we are right now. And this is something art can very much uh, deal with, you know, and they have um, tools to, to understand and to challenge, you know. You know. Um, so Those are 60 years. <laughs> um, so I think a theme today um, in this conversation has been learning. We talked about like civic education and learning from history, like how they're paramount to moving forward. Um, it was a learning experience even for us to figure out how to make this event happen, right? Um, so um, you also mentioned there were some, and this was actually, this came up in the chat too with a question from Adriana Mendez. Um, you know, some sort of fasc fascination uh, with like some, within some groups about like supporting the Cuban government instead of supporting the Cuban people. And so my question is then like, how do you continue this um, advocacy for learning and education um, despite the roadblocks um, where it feels like there's more than one party against you sometimes on an international stage, right? Um, like how do you reconcile that like fight for social justice and education where it seems like there's the oppression of the dissidents from the government with like the psychological war and everything you're mentioning and then disbelief from others like how do you reconcile that and how do you like find the strength to continue well the the first thing is to deal with uh to have respect uh towards other people's process i i it helps me a lot when i see not the person that is in front of me talking about what they don't know about my own reality but trying to understand in which a spectrum of the process of understanding the human reality they are. So we need to understand that it is a process. It is not a final uh, conclusion. It is a process in which you um, have to understand what the other person needs the most. Do they need more information? Do they need to have concrete examples? Do they need to read? Uh, historical, do, do, do they need to be part of the experience? Because not everybody learns the same way. So you cannot have like one slogan for everyone. You need to understand also where that person is coming from and what they, they wanted to find in Cuba, you know, and making sure that, well, if you find it, fine, but is this the reality or this is a, something that you wanted to see. And the, the other thing is, it is also very much part of the decolonizing process because we also have to 
to <laughs> decolonize people's image of Cuba, you know, where they are coming and as colonizers, they are treated differently. And I always say, and they are being shown a theater, you know, so go beyond, be, beyond the, the stage, go on the side, on the back of the stage, try to talk to people and, and humanize those people. Don't see uh, what is being shown to you only uh, because there are many levels of, of theatrali theatricality also uh, to survive in this country, you know, and, and you can have a person that meets somebody and say, no, everything is fine because they're afraid. They're not going to open up with you right away. So try to, to be generous, not to judge the Cubans, try to understand and to, and to, to listen instead of, uh, ju uh, you know, judging. But the other thing is that um, it is important also to to um, to be clear what is your position when you come here? Who are you? Because you are not only the person you were where you live. When you come to Cuba, you, you become something else. You become the person who can bring some freedom, who can bring some knowledge, who can bring some experiences to Cubans and to, and to encourage someone in a conversation to say, you know what, it's okay. To say, to say what you think. It is okay to want freedom, you know? Uh, so it is a two way. It is not only, uh, yeah, but it needs to be a very much, uh, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Definitely did. No, it's definitely, I completely appreciate your answer because it's definitely something that we grapple with, especially as Cuban Americans and young students who, you know, definitely come across like Oh, we some some of us are very involved in social justice issues, but then sometimes it's mentioned in Cuba, and then it's like a different ball game, and it's like it's the same social justice issue regardless of whether we're in Cuba, the United States, Russia, China, wherever. Like it's the same issue, but then it's Cuba, and it's like a different ball game. It's like the same ball game. Exactly, and, and I think it is very unfair to have a different uh, uh, measurement you know, for Cuba and for other people. The fact that China is a menace, international menace economically and, you know, and Cuba is just an island with good sun doesn't mean that they cannot be judged by the same, uh, you know, parameters, you know? And um, yeah, so I think this is, uh, especially you you mentioned the, the students who come to Cuba. I think this is important that we understand that these are state, run programs, you know, the same way they have in other country, I don't want to mention any country where they bring people to, a, to, you know, to put, you know, ideas in their heads about who they are. So basically, if you come to this program, if you are a student in Harvard, if you're a student in any of the Ivy Leagues or any, any university that comes to Cuba who is having this kind of exchange programs, please get out of the official program get out of the, those programs are fake. They have fake information and they have this kind of beautiful vision of Cuba. And they are, I mean, I don't want to be paranoid, but they almost look uh, as uh, brainwashing programs. So when you grow up, you have this emotional connection with Cuba that don't let you think clearly. And I give you one example why I say that. It sounds a little paranoid, like kind of, but I, I give you one example. I met a person from Mexico who is a diplomat, not in Cuba, in another country. And that person invited me for a dinner. We were talking about different issues and Cuba comes in. And I talk about Cuba and I explain everything that is happening and the lack of freedom of expression, the lack of freedom of the press association, all of this. And he told me at some point, Tanya, I understand you. Um, you know, objectively, I understand what you say, but I cannot connect with what you say. I say, I don't understand. I tell you my, my story because it's kind of offensive sometimes when you're telling your story and people don't believe you, you know? And, and, and I said, but I don't understand. I say, well, I tell you. I went to Cuba for the first time when I was 15 in an exchange program and we spent an amazing time, we went to a beach, we have all these classes, blah, 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 blah. And I had my first sexual experience in Cuba. And I was in awe. 
you're going to say, oh, okay, so now that's why you cannot be in solidarity with me. You know, that's why you don't understand what is happening. That's why you cannot be uh, an agent of change, you know, because you had an emotional relationship with Cuba that goes beyond your rationality. So please understand these programs of exchange are amazing, are great. I, I, I'm not against them, but understand that they're being designed to do this, to have long-term, the, the same long-term reaction that this friend of mine had where they incapacitate you to see reality because you had a kind of paradise like experience where you have fun, you're young. So you relate this to your good years of your life. Sorry, this is not Cuba. This is a Disney world they're creating for you. So yeah, get out of that. Like go to the lessons and then go out and meet real people and compare the knowledge they're giving you there and the knowledge people are, the reality people are living. You know, the, I should, I should uh, add a footnote to this uh, concerning our own program. Uh, our students are like, <laughs> well, our students are like, unlike many other programs, we, we have a study abroad program in, in, in Cuba. We've had it for many years, um, but our students take regular classes at the University of Havana. So they just join, you know, ordinary classes. They don't have a program for them. They insert themselves in the life of the university and they work with Cuban students in the same classrooms. It's a challenge sometimes in terms of language and also the teaching styles and pedagogic expectations and all this. But one thing that we always asked and, you know, we, we have worked with Cuban authorities in the Ministry of Higher Education about this, is that our students go to regular classes. So we don't, we don't want them to be in a Disney world in Cuba or anywhere else for that matter. You know? in the, so basically they, they register for a class that is of interest to them from ecology to political economy or history or whatever. And then they are in a classroom with 20 Cuban students just taking that. No, I think, yeah, I think that different programs. I, I only want to, to reiterate uh, and emphasize the fact that the students who, from abroad who come to Cuba, they have one privilege that the Cuban students don't have, yeah, sure. which is asking the uncomfortable questions because there will not be any punishment to them. There will be no consequences to them. You know, ask the uncomfortable question, get informed before you go to Cuba and ask those questions, you know. You know, I always, I always meet with students when they come back from the, from the study abroad. And invariably, invariably, they, um, they, they report that their most important learning experience is actually not even at the university, the classroom. It's about socializing and participating in the life of ordinary Cubans on the ground, you know, with the young people going to parties and living closer to the, what an ordinary Cuban would live. Um, it, let me say to our audience that it will be impossible to answer all the questions we have received. We're talking literally dozens of questions. There are a couple that uh, I see interrelated and that I think are very interesting, Tanya, for you. Um, one of them comes from a couple of colleagues from uh, Italy, actually, from Italian universities, the Universidad de Milan and University of Urbino. And this question has to deal with digital artivism, with what kind of difference a platform like Facebook uh, makes. Um, they, they know that um, in their perception, uh, your artistic practice uh, appears to have found a space on free, of freedom, of the unusual freedom in platforms like Facebook or, or other digital uh, platforms. So they, so they wonder if it is possible to talk about digital artivism now. And this connects with a question that Ted Henken had submitted to you. And it has to deal with the question, uh, you know, he notes uh, censorship is nothing new. This is, this is actually something that one in, in different ways and in different shapes has been part of the of cultural production in, in post-revolutionary Cuba since the early 1960s. But um, what is new and what is different about this moment? You know, what, 
what has changed? And perhaps the answer, I'm not sure, but perhaps the answer has something to do with the digital artivism angle. And that's why I'm putting the two questions together. No, definitely um, there is a, a big uh, change since we have internet, but more than that, there is a big change now that there is digital activism. Uh, mostly, most of the, of the activism is digital. And one of the things that has been very beautiful is the fact that it has created a new Cuba, a digital Cuba where people inside and outside have the same rights, have the same options and can speak freely together. And they can slowly build up new um, dynamics, you know, new dynamics to deal with things, new solutions and new, I don't know, like new ways to interact and to, and to be together. So I think this is uh, it's interesting also because the pandemic has uh, had made that even uh, more clear, uh, how the new Cuba is a digital Cuba you know, is in the internet and is one where people who think very differently are together trying to figure it out, how to get together, you know. And um, right now the real dialogue, the real national dialogue is happening on the internet, on Facebook, on every time there is an issue and you see all of the community um, answering and, and, and trying to figure it out. And, and of course, making mistakes because sometimes you see people who, who are repeating sometimes things they criticize from the government or because let's say they get anxious and they want people to answer the way they want or they want to force people to declare something if they don't. So there, there is all this beautiful process of learning uh, and having a civic digital education that has been happening for the last years. That is quite, quite amazing. And this is not being noticed by the government because the government is, has created, um, I don't have your the info right now, but it has created, or is in the process of creating this law to start controlling the internet. They already had created the Decreto Ley 370 where they uh, actually, uh, uh, find people who put stuff on the internet they don't agree the government don't like you know even if it's your own story even if it's a, a, a facebook live in front of your house that just you know crumble and, and disappear that you know whatever is uncomfortable to them they they are regulated by that and actually in one of the times one of the times i, I was detained i learned in the, being there that most of the people who were um detained in the police station were actually people who could not pay the fine uh for the 370 because the fines are outrageous you know is the equivalent of the salary of a month of a Cuban, you know. So I think this is how 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 well the internet, the Cuba, the digital Cuba is 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 living, is is existing when the government is so much uh, so interested in controlling it. They really, really, really now focus on controlling that, and they even actually they even. Um, that went a little bit unnoticed. I mean, some people talked about it, but a little bit unnoticed um, that they also had a law where the government allow itself to, to look at your uh, private communication, you know, uh, through the WhatsApp and all the digital uh, resources. So I think this is how afraid they are. Um, I think today we are a better Cuba because of the digital Cuba because we have solved problems there that the government has been unable to solve. We have been talking about very, very painful and difficult issues on the net, on the internet, that the government has not had the, the, the force or, or, the, or the strength to talk publicly. Yeah, so I think it's, it's an amazing resource. And people are changing because of it. You know, people are, are, are changing who they think they are in the society because of the interactions on the internet and the discussions there. Mm. 
Thank you. Uh, Doris. Among the many, many questions here, Tanya, I, uh, I would like to um, invite you to think about uh, one that Elizabeth Dor Doré wrote. She, she's asking about what is the alternative that you and your allies are imagining when you say that art allows us to imagine differently. What, what is in waiting? Uh, I remember a previous conversation that we had in preparation for this one. Uh, we talked about um, the uh, possible uh, allure of what looks like uh, liberal democracies in other countries that, uh, that have certain traps in, in um, capitalist development. Uh, so what is it that you're imagining as the alternative in waiting? Well, I'm going to talk um, uh, my personal point of view. I'm not talking uh, on anybody's behalf or any group because I belong to many groups. But um, I think, nevertheless, I think um, I will definitely give you the link. So when you put this online, you have the link uh, or invite people to check the 27N Facebook page. Uh, and look for the manifesto that was uh, written uh, collectively by many of us. I think this is uh, where exactly we want is being explained. But now, uh, personally speaking, I think that we need to, to have a society where um, collective rights are not, uh, personal rights are not uh, taken away because uh, in order for the collective right to exist. And we cannot have the collective rights eliminated in order to have uh, private and, and, and per, per, personal rights. So I think this is one of the first balances that I think we need to, to find out how to have a society where you have both. One do not, eliminate the other because now in Cuba the the way in which the government is working is they uh, blackmail you with the idea that if you have uh, personal rights then that will mean the collective rights are gone you know I think this is a, a problem that uh, is not really a problem <laughs> Um, so I think this is one thing. The other thing is that uh, there were many things in that area that have been, um, you know, there are things that work. We don't, the things that work, we should not take them away. But we need to give, first of all, political rights. If we don't have political rights, and if we don't have, uh, for example, laws that are fair, you know, just laws, this is a problem. I think we need to have, uh, there is a big corruption in this country, something people don't talk about. There is a big, big culture of corruption. And one of the first thing I would do, I mean, or propose, let's say, is to have a commission, an anti-corruption commission. And so in order for this to be the first thing, then to uh, start by giving rights. Um, I think, a, through the law, you can ensure that people lose their, their fear. You know, you can do that with the law. You can make sure people lose their fear. And um, yeah, I have many ideas. I don't know if this, this will happen. The thing is, uh, this will probably be on the national TV at some point. So I need to think very clearly what I'm saying here. So basically, yes, I think these are, are things that I would do give political rights uh, to everyone, of course, with that giving uh, the rights of association, freedom of expression, but more than anything, change education. You know, education in Cuba is based on memory, is based on giving the right answer to the professor. Uh, I, will, I will create a different uh, education where people are thinking and more Cartesian maybe <laughs> education where you ask instead of uh, repeat, you know? Yeah. No, I think we need to liberate the, for the economic forces also 
we need to to finally finally uh, uh, be respect all the international agreements we have done with the UN you know the political uh, civic uh, agreements we have signed and, and to stop being and to stop pretending being democratic and enter the painful uh, the painful road of democracy you know because right now the government is playing as if they were, but they are not, you know? So they are selling themselves to the world uh, as if they want to be democratic and activists don't let them, and it's actually the opposite. So, yeah. But, but I don't have a political program, is that is what they are asking. Then if I had it, I would not say it yet. Yeah. It's uh, it's an interesting. And also, I will, no, I will also. The other thing that I will do is is uh, is take away privilege from the political caste. Right now, we have a political caste. Here is not about well, money and, and political caste is is related, but is to give uh, take away those privilege because, for example, you cannot. Uh, you cannot uh, accept, I mean, I cannot accept, nobody should accept that a minister of culture is able to slap an artist, you know, and nothing happens. You know, at the moment we are having a group of us in 27N, we are uh, doing a demand, you know, asking the government to remove the minister of culture uh, from his post because he not only uh, slap an artist, um, but also he witnessed how the police beat artists and put them with for, uh, through the force, like with force into uh, these buses and put them in prison, detain them. And the minister of culture, the person who's supposed to represent the artist was there witnessing how repression was put upon artists doing nothing. So this is what I mean. We need to stop political privileges for the people who are in power. So and we need to put these popular tribunals that they are in other countries where, the, where we can have, let's say, a, a, a civic government that run parallel to the political, and the, and the political administration. You know, the people who are in power because we need to give power to the citizens. We need to give power to the civic society. And right now, this is not existent. This is not existent. Yeah. But if, if you'll allow me just to explore a bit there, um, this important list of demands that you just described, um, they sound like important reformist demands. I mean, in this country, we have a problem with abuse of police with an industry of uh, prisons, uh, we have lots of work to do to end corruption. Um, how, how different is this kind of agenda? Uh, is it a reformist agenda that you're imagining? I think there is uh, there are some reforms to be made and there are some complete change to be made. I think some things could be Reformers, some things need to be cut from, you know, com change completely. You can, some things cannot remain. Some, some things that are happening right now in Cuba do not have, do not allow us the space to keep them uh, and transform them. There are things that are happening in Cuba like repression and, and, and lack of freedom and, and so on that needs to be changed completely, you know. This do not allow reforms. Some things, yes, you, maybe some things can be reformed, not everything. Yeah. Yeah. And this is funny that you talk about the situation in the United States because this is exactly what the Cuban government uses all the time. For example, right now, um, and it's part of the propaganda, like, oh, in Cuba, nothing happened. These are three or four people who are just, uh, you know, anarchists or they, they are troublemakers, you know, so they, we are not, they don't even give us the status of activists. They're not troublemakers, you know, they are paid by the CIA or they are, you know, whatever. So the thing is uh, that 
we need to stop that frame. Uh, I mean, that, that way of justifying Cuban violence, you know, the Cuban government's violence, because the violence here is um, psychological more than physical. What, what I mean by that is when you, since, I'll give you an example, since the 16th of November, I have been uh, forbidden to go out of my house. I had count more or less 30 some days that I have been able to be out of my house since the 16th of November, six months. So in six months, I've only been allowed to go out of my house 30 some days. So I think this is something that is very hard to show, you know, it's not an image of me being beaten by the police, it's not, you know, me screaming uh, in a torture chamber, but it's also torture. It is also torture because it is a modification of the way you live. It is uh, an intermission, uh, you know, it's putting you in a set of mind where you feel you are in prison without bars. So I think this is, we need to understand that not the abuse and the political abuse and, and, the, and, you know, and the political inequality in every country is not the same. It is very visual in other countries. Right now we have Colombia that has people who are dying, who are dying in the streets. In Cuba, there are people who are dying of hunger strike. There are people who are dying psychologically. It's not the same, I'm not comparing. I think both are horrible and we cannot accept any of those, but you need to understand what are the subtleties. Maybe if they allowed us to go outside and manifest and demonstrate like everywhere else, maybe we had people injured, but they injure us spiritually. They make us zombies. We made, they made us social zombies that we don't know what to feel anymore. We don't know how to react anymore. We don't know who we are anymore. So it is brilliant. We don't need, they don't need to beat us in the street. They beat us in our, inside our own head. You know? So I think this is important because it's a big argument people use like, where are the dead people? Where are the, you know, the, the martyrs of your cause? We are all, we are all that. You know, the fact that I have not been able to create a single artwork since November means that I'm dying inside, you know? So this is who I am, I'm an artist. And I, have been, I haven't been able to be creative since November because I have so much pressure, you know, and so much oppression and so much like paranoia and so many, so many uh, interrogation sessions that I don't know why. And they come and they take you from your house and they interrogate you for eight hours, you know? So this is in, 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 important that people understand that political abuse is, has, uh, is not the same everywhere, you know? And I'm talking about me, but there are all people who are even in worse condition. You know, I'm a person who have disability that is today talking here at Harvard, something they are very afraid of. Probably I get an interrogation after this, but, but there are all people who have even worse condition. We have right now a person 19 days in a hospital, sequestered in a hospital by the Cuban government. And the Cuban government is saying he's okay, his health is okay. Then we ask, why is he in a hospital if he's okay? You know, so I think this, there are many, many cases. We had, for example, um, an activist that was in prison in a psychological ward just because she's an activist. So they make her think she's crazy, you know? So, and she was like six months in prison. Now she, she has been relieved. We, you know, we have been doing all of, all of these activists are fighting for this, for this, you know what I mean? So it's not, the, the repression in Cuba has gone into this subtle invisibility that is killing us very slowly, you know? And it's very hard to show. Yeah. Thank you, Danya. Um, so just to switch gears a little bit back into your work and kind of like your work with Instar and everything, um, 
and just like US Cuba relations as well. Um, there's a really good anonymous question. Um, don't know who sent okay. it in, but thank you to that person um, because they had asked um, what role or relevance does US foreign policy toward Cuba have for your work at Instar or for the Cuban civil society more broadly? Um, is the debate over US policy a, a distraction, um, a scapegoat, or can US policy in fact make a difference, um, create an enabling or constraining environment for the kinds of conversations and changes that you seek and you speak about? Um, do you feel like it's important or relevant for Cuban civil society to weigh in on this debate? Mm -hmm. I think is, uh, for example, um, I belong to a group, 27M, and that group decided not to declare publicly anything about uh, Cuban foreign policy or the US policies toward Cuba because, or any other like European either, because we uh, want to focus on how to change ourselves, how to change things here, but also because we are a very, very, very diverse group. And we have inside our group people who are communists. Actually, we, a few days ago, uh, somebody from the Communist Party joined the group and it was a big discussion in the group. It was very beautiful how to, for us to deal with this uh, because some people have been victim of the Communist Party uh, policies. Um, and, and we have also people who wants to, who are super anti-communist, you know. So this is a very uh, varied group. So we, we decided not to do that. So that's, that's one thing that I like very much. I think we should not uh, make the freedom and the democratic process in Cuba go through uh, another country's uh, will to, to, to join us in it. Um, secondly, I think that um, we need people who are with us, not people who tell us what to do. Um, and we have to be very careful because um, sometimes we are not the priority of any government. <laughs> you know, we the humans, I mean, we are not, we have people who sympathize with us, who can help us, who can assist us, but the, the Cuba that we want has to be done by the Cubans. And then those governments who are um, around us should accompanarnos, no, they should be with us, you know, and, and be next to us in a, in a fair um, exchange, you know, where, yes, I can ask a question, I don't know the answer, but that person of that government can also ask us a question where they don't know the answer. You know, so I think it would be good to, to have a, an equitative relationship and that when those governments want to talk to us, uh, the Cuban society or civic society, talk to us with respect and in the same conditions. Because if we want a dialogue with the Cuban government with same conditions, we also have to have that with everybody else. I don't know if that is the answer that person wanted, but yes. Thank you for speaking to that. Thank you for speaking to that because it was a, that question, of course, in different ways, that question came up from several people in the audience who want to know what you and the people you work with think about US Cuba relations. And I want to say very clearly I don't work for any foreigner agency. I don't work for any intelligent any, uh, agency. I don't work, I don't receive money from the CIA, from FBI, from anyone, from nobody in the world. I receive money only for my own work as an artist. I just want to say that for the people who, who might ask that question. Um, and, and, and I think it's very important that we do not put right now the issue Cuba-US relationship as the main uh, problem for the Cuban path to democracy. I think that's not the main problem. I think that is something that will come 
when Cuba is democratic and needs to open up to the world. And then we will see what is our relationship, but that cannot divide us. And this is a, a, a call I make here to the people who are here who have that, made that question. Please do not make that question what makes you decide who you align with. We all need to be together now. The people who think it's okay or it's not okay to relate to the US, we need to all be together. This is not the moment to say, oh, she is pro or against embargo, or oh, she is pro or against US-Cuba relationship. This is not what we should be talking about right now. This is not what should decide who we align with right now. We can solve that later when we have democracy. Thank you, Tanya. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to wrap up uh, with a final question because okay. we've used uh, and abused your time again. <laughs> today and um, with a note of thanks to all the people who, who are still with us. Uh, we hope to have at least addressed some of your questions. This is a conversation that will continue. This is just one, one more time in which we get together with Tanya, this conversation. Uh, I promise you will continue. Uh, I want to reiterate our gratitude to the Embassy of the Czech Republic for making it possible to chat with Tanya today and to talk about uh, about her work. And I'm going to I'm going to ask the final question uh, in Spanish. With uh, and I beg the audience to excuse me uh, if that's a problem. But and I'm going to invite Tanya to answer that question in Spanish if she wants. Uh, and if, if, if that's the case, we will transcribe in the video. We will include uh, a transcription in the video in English uh, of, of both my question and her answer so that you can um, have access to it. Okay, and that question in Spanish is, um, si tú pudieras mandarle un mensaje directamente al presidente de Cuba, al presidente Díaz-Canel, eh, ¿cuál sería tu mensaje? Bueno, muchas gracias por esa pregunta. Eh, señor presidente Díaz-Canel, eh, yo quisiera decirle que eh, no tenga miedo al pueblo. El pueblo no es su enemigo. Eh, usted tiene una función histórica muy importante, que es llevar eh, este país a una transición democrática. Estamos con usted para ese proceso. Por favor, Háganos parte de ese proceso, por favor, empiece ese proceso de transición donde no se pierda la justicia eh, social y donde todos los ciudadanos tengamos los mismos derechos. Eh, denos, eh, denos derechos políticos, es decir, estamos eh, pidiendo derechos políticos para entonces tener libertades eh, individuales, libertades de expresión, libertades de asociación, eh, libertades de credo. Eh, para poder tener una prensa libre, para poder asociarnos libremente. Eh, no tengan miedo, el gobierno no tiene por qué tenerle miedo a sus ciudadanos. Eh, estamos todos construyendo un país que es de todos eh, y no vamos a estar de acuerdo en todas las cosas y no hay ningún problema. Lo importante es que nos respetemos. Eh, también le pediría que por favor empezara un proceso de transparencia institucional con respecto al gobierno. Eh, también le pediría que entienda que estar en el poder significa ser eh, eh, una persona y ser una institución que tiene que rendir cuentas. De, de ahí la, el deseo de tener más transparencia institucional. Eh, por favor, cree una comisión anticorrupción gubernamental. Eh, por favor, también convoque usted, Díaz-Canel, convoque usted al diálogo nacional, que tanta falta nos hace, pero convoque a un diálogo nacional donde estemos todos en igualdad de condiciones. Las personas que les son a ustedes incómodas y las personas que no son a nosotros incómodas. Sentémonos todos juntos como cubanos a dialogar y a ver qué se puede salvar y qué se puede cambiar y qué se puede transformar. Eh, le pediría a Díaz-Canel que se leyera el manifiesto del 27N. Eh, también creo que eh, sería bueno que se entendiera que la sociedad civil cubana ya está lista para ser parte de un proceso de incidencia 
política y de incidencia social mucho mayor. Eso, por ejemplo, se vio muy claro durante el tornado eh, hace dos años, cuando la sociedad civil se organizó y, e incluso logró hacer cosas que el gobierno no pudo hacer. Entonces, denos el crédito para nosotros poder seguir trabajando eh, con respecto a esto. Eh, y cuando hablo del tornado, también hablo de la sociedad civil, que incluye a las personas que están fuera de Cuba. Hubo muchas personas que compraron pasajes para traer sillas de ruedas, medicina, y es importante que no se vea más a la... Al, a los cubanos fuera de Cuba solamente como una caja, caja, caja chica de dinero, que no se vea solamente a, lo, a los cubanos que vienen fuera como, como los que van a apoyar económicamente el país, sino personas que también tienen derechos y que han aprendido durante su proceso de vivir en otros países cosas que nos pueden ser beneficiosas a los cubanos en Cuba y cosas que pueden ser beneficiosas para ese proceso en el que ya estamos de cambio en Cuba. Entonces, por favor, eh, darle también derechos eh, a ellos, no solamente demandarles, sino darles derechos a los cubanos y eliminar todas esas leyes eh, injustas como estas que acaban de, de explicar el otro día en, en la televisión. Yo creo que también sería decirle que eh, pedirle que por favor la ideología no signifique más una camisa de fuerza y que eh, se cambie el clima de odio político que se ha creado en su gobierno hacia las personas que piensan diferente. Eh, yo quisiera saber cuánto cuesta la libertad de Cuba y vamos a sentarnos a negociar. Díganos cuánto cuesta la libertad de Cuba y estamos dispuestos a negociar lo que sea. Vamos a negociar la libertad de Cuba porque hace falta ya llegar a ese, o sea, no podemos seguir en esta situación. Entonces, eh, yo entiendo que los diálogos que se han pedido con el gobierno han sido traicionados, han sido saboteados, eh, han sido desacreditados, eh, pero todavía creemos que, eh, llamamos a que hay un espacio para que nos sentemos en igualdad de condiciones y para eso, por supuesto, tiene que parar el acoso la difamación, soltar a los presos políticos y eh, entender que ustedes tienen una verdadera voluntad de cambio, de cambios reales, y eh, que por favor eh, el presidente Díaz Canel entienda que en sus manos puede estar salvar este país, no solo de ser un lugar donde faltan derechos para sus ciudadanos, sino un lugar que puede eh, salir de la precariedad. La sociedad cubana está deseosa y además está preparada para ser próspera y libre. Gracias. Well, thank you so much, Tania, for those um, concluding remarks. I, I very much hope somebody hears this. Um, I, I really I hope do. so. Um, I think there, is, there is no possible dialogue without listening to each other. Um, and so and there is no dialogue without uncomfortable moments. They want to have a, a Disney World dialogue where everybody is happy. No, you have to have difficult dialogues. And I cannot conceive that the Cuban government could be negotiating um, the peace treaty in Colombia and they cannot uh, you know, negotiate their own peace with their own citizens, you know? So that's inconceivable. So, I want to thank you again, the, the embassy, for giving us the space uh, today. And this is the kind of uh, relationship we should have with other countries. So they are supporting us. Thank this you. is a conversation to be continued. Uh, again, uh, we will be posting the video of this event uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm told. Uh, we will transcribe Tanya's uh, final answer uh, so that it is available in English and accessible in English to everyone. And, you know, stay tuned. This conversation will go on. Muchas gracias, Tania. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias a todos. For, gracias a todos. For insisting and for uh, taking the time again to be with us and, and for sharing this platform for, with, with us. Gracias. Gracias a todos.